Hi, everyone. <laughs> so we're going to get started. Welcome back to day two of the 10th annual Youth Adirondack Youth Climate Summit. My name is Erica. This is my second year attending and planning the Climate Summit, and I'm super excited for today because today is the day we get to do our uh, climate action plans, which is like the main point, and it's super fun. So just a really quick thank you to our 2018 sponsors. They're super great and supportive, and you'll actually probably see some of them throughout. You probably saw some of them yesterday, and you'll probably see a few more today. Um, and that's just how dedicated and amazing they are that they've actually come to our event to support and say hello. So we love them. Please give them a huge round of applause. And so for a little inspiration for today, here's a few words for some, from some of our alumni who have gone on to do amazing things with climate. Emphasis on the home video part. <laughs> <laughs> well, my advice for all of you attending this year's summit is to feel the excitement and passion by those around you and to open your eyes to the new ideas and perspectives about how we can move forward in this fight together. If one thing that Youth Climate Summit gave me it was an understanding that the problems that we face here in our local communities in New York are really international in scope. And the people you meet along the way are some of the greatest you'll meet in your entire life. The first time that I felt empowered to make the changes in the world that I wanted was at the Youth Climate Summit. My time there not only gave me a community, but that feeling that if there was something that I wanted to do in the world, there was always someone else who was ready, willing, and able to jump right in alongside me. So my message to you is to find those people and do those things together. One piece of advice I have for you guys is to really talk about this issue with anyone, with those that are important, and be comfortable talking about it and do it often because it's really important that this message is spread out to everyone and it's something that we still are missing. My advice for all of you at the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit this year is to be present and engage with everyone and everything around you. Make friends, make connections, build a support network, and soak in all of the information and passion around you. Carry that passion and momentum with you that you gained at the summit and never let it fade. My advice to current attendees would be to be creative, think outside the box, but most importantly, commit to the plan that you develop. One of the greatest feelings ever is completing a project that has a positive impact. Every year that we spend in a state of inaction, the earth is getting warmer. So don't feel limited as a student, feel empowered to make a difference. If I want you to remember one thing, it's this. Be the change you want to see in the world. Because yes, you can impact positive change, and you will. We are so lucky to have so many amazing alumni that keep in touch with us um, and stay involved with the Youth Climate Program. And I hope when all of you um, become accomplished in doing your climate action plans and going to college that you all stay in touch with us, uh, with us too. And then one day you could be up there giving advice to the next round of Youth Climate Summit students. So really quick, we're just going to go through today's agenda. Right now, we're in the Flamer Theater so that we can have our climate leader, plan, uh, cl climate leader panel as well as a Bright, Sprot Bright Spots presentation. And we'll have our climate action plan presentation. And then we'll move on to climate action planning. And then at 1130, we'll have our school poster session and professional expo, which is a super awesome opportunity for all of you to get great ideas for your climate action plan and learn about resources available to you. And then we'll have our green building tours at the same time. And quick note to teachers, please get your lunch at 1145 and be in the naturalist cabinet at 12. We're starting exactly at 12 um, and for the teacher workshop. And then at, at the same time, the student roundtable talks will happen. So everybody look at your name tag right now and look at the color of the sticker on your name tag. So one might be green or tan. And that corresponds with a themed table that you will set out for lunch. So this is a great opportunity to meet students from outside your green team and just get to know them. But we're also going to talk about 
um, different things at each table. So one table might be composting and one table might be working with your town board. Um, so please sit at the, your corresponding table at lunch. And then we'll move on to more climate action planning. Um, and then we'll have our CAP talk out and the grand finale. You do not want to miss the grand finale, so don't even think about leaving early. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> So for the green building tours, this we just want to emphasize, please send one person from each team. So if you see your name in the 1130 column, um, send one student to meet at the admissions desk at 1130 um, to go on the tour. It's about 20 minutes, but please only send one person. And then if you see, see your team's name under 12 p.m., meet at the admissions desk at 12 p.m. It's going to give you a second to find the name of your school so you know what time you can go out. Are there any questions about that tour? It's um, a tour highlighting the green technology here at the Wild Center. Bring your yeah, you'll go outside. One please, person from each emphasis, team. only send one person from your team. One. <laughs> okay. And so really quick, this is just a list of the professional organizations um, joining us at the professional expo today in the Find Out Forest. Um, so these are awesome resources for you to use, not only during your climate action plan, but in other endeavors your club might take. So please use them, because they are super awesome and a great resource for you. Okay. We just like hit you all with a lot of logistics. Are there any questions about today and how it's going to go? OK, awesome. It's going to be a great day. Um, so we are going to transition into our climate leader panel. Um, so just give us a second while we rearrange, set up, um, and invite our climate leader panelists up to the stage. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then do I get it? close the gate? Okay. Awesome. Oh, no, mine's over Okay, look, that was fast. Here we are. It's a panel. Um, so this morning, we have about an hour of different student leaders that we're going to be showcasing that have been amazing and inspirational climate leaders in their communities. Um, so today on our panel, I'm so excited to introduce, we have three fellows from the Alliance for Climate Education. Um, they're another organization that empowers young people to take climate action in their communities, um, and they are work all across the United States. And these three fellows traveled up from New York City, like on a super long bus ride to be with us just for the two days of this. So we're so happy that they're here. Um, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> And then we also have Caroline Dodd, um, the illustrious Youth Climate Program alumni <laughs> who joined us from Cornell. So we can welcome her. So you might have gotten a chance to uh, learn from all of these young leaders during their workshops yesterday. Um, but we wanted to set aside some time for them to share how they got into climate action, some of their experiences, and then advice they have for all of you as you set out um, to do, take climate action in your communities too. So to start us off, um, if you could just give us a little intro of who you are and how you got involved in climate action as a young person. All right, hi, my name's Hakeem from New York City, and I got my start 
not with ACE, but with another New York State program called the Reality Check of New York, which deals with public health, specifically tobacco control. And I was looking at the intersections of um, the pollution within the tobacco industry and the environment. And that led me to ACE, where I was an action fellow in my senior year of high school. And then ACE would just not let me go. So while in college I, and in high school, I got many opportunities to do workshops, learn about climate science, and taking action, and helping other people my age to do the same. Hi, everyone. My name is Afsana. And um, I, I think I started being a climate leader after I took a climate change course in my high school. Um, and I was in 11th grade. And, um, and right after I kind of, while I was in that course, um, my teacher introduced me to Mayan from ACE. And that's how I got you know, involved with ACE. And they never let me go either. <laughs> and um, so yeah, the, and then I started doing um, a lot of different things like organizing and campaigning, um, doing workshops and facilitating, um, doing like keynote speeches at like different events. Um, and yeah, and while I was in college, I was still involved. And I, I just graduated, and I'm still <laughs> involved with ACE, so yeah. Hi, my name is Ariana, and I don't remember s when I started being a climate leader because I am originally from Bangladesh and we're a country, small country next to India that is surrounded by water on all three sides and half of our country is underwater every year during monsoon season. And so like even in, in elementary school and like I remember we would have annual food drives or uh, annual clothing drives for people that were people whose homes were displaced by climate change and these annual floods. And so I didn't know all of those impacts were because of climate change until I moved to New York City. And um, I started high school and got involved with my school's environmental club and other organizations, which eventually led me to ACE. And um, it's, it's weird now because I'm like in college and apparently a certified adult. And <laughs> I think I have to like teach other people about it and it's it's weird like being this adult and like having to talk about it in a sense like oh where did you get your start and it's like i don't remember for me this has always been a part of my story and who i've been so yeah um hi i'm caroline i'm from saranac lake right that way and um i have grown up i grew up here um and the Adirondacks have always been a really special and important place to me, um, but it wasn't until I kind of started doing work with the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit um, in middle school, actually, that I even like thought about climate change conceptually. I knew that our winters were shorter. I knew um, that we were having more rain and um, severe weather, but I didn't know why, and I didn't know like what climate change meant. And so this um, program really exposed me not only to the science of it, but also um, how many people were out, out there already like um, professionally helping create solutions for it. And um, I was like, this is the most important thing ever. We're losing everything that we thought we knew was permanent and um, stable, and we really need to do something about this. And so I thought that um, I, I needed to be a part of that. And so I, I am. And I continued my work with the Youth Climate Program. I study environmental science um, in college. And throughout college, I've done a lot of other different work um, for other nonprofits. I've worked in um, ocean chemistry research and um, just kind of explored every part of this um, kind of really interesting um, concept and problem that we're facing that I can throughout college. And um, so I'm really excited to be here um, back where all of this started, I guess. So here is where um, my whole climate story began. Everybody. Um, uh, <laughs> so you all have spent a few years um, as climate leaders, can you share with us a moment 
from your time as a climate leader that you are most proud of? So I'm proud of every moment, so I'll just go with the most recent, other than this moment. <laughs> so recently in September, um, Ariana and I and some other members of the ACE team went to San Francisco for the Global Climate Action Summit, and there were a lot of delegates from all over the world, and we kind of shared our voice with those who would listen, but we also called out the establishment that like didn't amplify our voices enough and we made that heard that that was crazy like you invited us to something but you still tried to silence our voices so even in that situation it was a proud moment because we stood our ground and we held true to our values and that's what we learned to do in ACE and even though it was a climate summit I mean it was kind of not as diverse as they wanted it to be, but they're the ones who ran it. So we called them out on that, and we called BS on everything that they did in that moment, even though it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. But it really teaches you that some moments, even when you're enjoying what you're doing, you have to speak up when it's not 100% right. Um, so one of my um, best memories as a climate leader, does this work? Okay. Um, was uh, the climate march in New York City in 2014. Um, I, th I feel like that was like the moment when I was really uh, like I joined a part of the movement and I could feel it and there were uh, like over 300,000 people who marched um, in New York City and it was like one of the biggest um, climate march in history and I, I was so glad to be a part of that um, and it was like it was an invitation to change everything and people from all different groups and organizations came even if you know it was totally it's pr maybe it seemed like it wasn't connected to climate change but it was and they all came um, together to march for what they believed, which was justice, uh, climate justice. Um, and that also gave me an, in, like, an opportunity to work more with um, Alliance for Climate Education. Um, I wrote like, my story with 350.org. I um, had the chance to publish an op-ed about the climate change and the climate march. Um, so it just opened a lot of doors for me and uh, made me more involved and more as a climate leader. Um, so yeah. Um, so I also have a lot of favorite moments, but one of the most recent ones um, involves something that I wasn't necessarily like comfortable with and hadn't done before. So I went to Utah and did a performance um, on cli about climate change through spoken word. And, um, and I guess it just opened my eyes up to the fact that we could all explore these issues that we care about through art or through op-eds or through whatever medium that we want to explore those things in or want to teach people about. And, and so like, you know, like standing up on stage and like reciting poetry, I've never done that before. So it was nerve wracking one, on one hand, but on the other hand, it was, um, it encouraged me to like want to talk about climate change in all the ways that I possibly could. And I hope that like you guys do the same whether you're interested in music, art, um, the science of it, just, you know, explore all of them. Um, I think that my proudest moment is not really like a specific moment, it's just kind of um, this entire semester. I am in a class that was an application process to, um, each, so there's groups of like five, um, I think four groups of five in this class or five, and um, each of us is responsible for helping a delegation uh, to COP24, the climate negotiations in Poland this year, um, kind of prepare their delegation and um, be the best 
negotiators that they can be because the, the um, delegations that we're preparing are very small. So I'm working with the Kingdom of Tonga, which is a uh, Pacific Island nation, and they're very, very, very vulnerable to climate impacts. Their country won't exist in probably 50 years, um, 100 at the most, and so they have to deal with kind of the immensity of that um, just just thinking about it is, is super scary, but um, but because they have such a small delegation, it's hard for them to um, address all of the issues they could. So we're working on this project to um, kind of prepare them for that. And it's proud for me because I, I I feel, I mean, I feel kind of like underprepared and a little bit like afraid of this as a challenge, but also um, really honored that um, that I'm thought of as kind of capable of of doing something that's so important and so large. Um, and yeah, so that's just been really exciting and, um, and cool this semester. Nice, thank you. Um, so I wanted to give everyone a heads up too. I could ask all of these people questions all day, um, but after uh, my next question, there'll be a chance for questions from the audience. So I just wanted to give you that in advance so you can be thinking of a question that you might like to ask the panel. Um, so you just shared some of your um, most impressive accomplishments, and it's so inspiring to hear that. But we know that becoming a leader and working on your leadership skills is a growing process, and sometimes it's a bumpy road. Um, so with that in mind, could you share one of your most challenging moments as a youth climate leader? A big bump in the road was in 2016. In September 2016, when I went to the UN headquarters in New York City, and that was the ratification of the Paris Agreement. That was when it was set to go in force that same November. And I was like one of two young people in the room that saw what happened and witnessed greatness. And then, boom, the administration pulled out. And that was a challenging moment for me um, personally. And I know it was a challenging moment for the climate movement as a whole. Um, yeah, similar to what Hakeem said, when um, you know um, Trump got elected, that's, I think that's when I kind of felt really, just I felt like, if our if our like the country's leader is not on with this movement, then it just felt so discouraging. And um, you know, and the fact that he thinks that climate change is a hoax and it's and that it's not human induced at all, um, it was just kind of in a really sad place to be at. But um, and the fact that he also was um, pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement and um, really like losing this opportunity to, opportunity to be a global leader. Um, that was just terrifying, but also at the same time, it urges us to um, work together even harder because regardless of whether what our leaders believe, climate change is real and it is happening and we should be taking action. So um, it doesn't matter what he believes because at local and, you know, um, like global um, level, we are, if we all work together, we can do this. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so on a smaller scale, like they address one of the challenges that I've also had in the bigger scale, but on a smaller scale, like one of the biggest challenges that I've had was having conversations about climate change. It's tough when you like so wholeheartedly believe in something and you're passionate about something and the person, like a family member that you talk to or maybe a close friend that you talk to shuts you down and they say that they're uh, completely apathetic towards it or maybe they do care and just don't know how to express that they care. So um, I've had to navigate through those conversations um, with my parents. And one of the things that ACE taught me was how to navigate through those conversations. So I learned that coming um, and talking about climate change from a point of view that they, they might care about makes the topic more accessible to them. So I don't know about your parents, but my parents care about the electricity bill. <laughs> and, uh, um, and you know, like, so when I told them that, hey, like, we could switch to 
like cleaner energy sources that would make our bill like lower or maybe just switching out the light bulb in our home and like it will make our bill lower. They were like, yeah, no, we're all for that. And so it was like, you know, um, I don't know if you know this, but you're like helping me kind of take a small action towards climate change now. And they were like, oh, that's cool, you know? And our bill was cheaper, cheaper right? And I was like, yep. And so, <laughs> yeah, so like kind of finding an angle where you can talk to your parents or your close friends about climate change is so, so important. And at the same time, so, so challenging. But you can do it. <laughs> So I, I can't. I have two challenges, um, and I guess I'll just say both of them because I can't decide which one is like more important. But um, the first one just kind of echoes um, what our first two panelists said that um, <clears throat> when. So I attended this this kind of tag teams off of yours. I attended the entry into force of the Paris Agreement, um, and then. I was like, what? Like, what's the point of me as an American being here right now? Um, I feel I felt ashamed to represent um even representing young people from my country because um you know the decisions that our administration makes reflect upon our whole country no matter no matter who you are or how like climate active you are um and so I've kind of grappled with that ever since um and I I don't really have a good solution or um you know I haven't really solved how to address that yet um in myself and in um, like a greater scale because I just like, I, I don't know how we can go into international negotiations and have anyone want to take us seriously and that's just something that we have to um, kind of fight against because obviously there are lots of leaders out there still who want to take action on climate change but um, our country doesn't look good right now, unfortunately. Um, so that's one. And then the other one is that um, I, I just want to emphasize that you can't do everything. <laughs> um, and that's something that I've had to like kind of grapple with in college especially because like college is hard and takes a lot of time. Um, and as much as I wish I could go to every event, every summit, every, um, you know, what have you, I, I can't. I'm one person. We are all individuals and we all have to prioritize, you know, um, personal growth, intellectual growth, um, in addition to being a leader, because those things are integral to being a leader. And so um, it's just kind of stepping back and like recognizing that about yourself is um, really important. Well, thank you for being willing to sharing, willing to share your challenging moments with us. I know um, it's easy to talk about the successes, but sometimes we learn a lot more from the challenges that we face. So thanks for being open to sharing those with us. Um, so are there any questions from the audience that you would like to bring up with this panel? I mean, I have a lot more. <coughs> It's kind of a question, but because you all talked, a lot of you talked about the Paris Agreement. So, in the U.S. pulling out of it, do you know what day is the day that we can we will officially pull out of the agreement? November ninth, November twenty twenty. Right Election, but only if he loses. <laughs> we're like, so we're not like officially like out of the agreement, but we're so our president is like working towards moving out of it. But it can only, but it takes it's a long process. So like for you to move out of it, um, so the date actually falls like right after his like the, after the next election. So there is a possibility, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> that um, you know he doesn't win and in the next election and. We don't have so we if don't you turn 18, out, so. vote. <laughs> yeah. Vote next vote. election. And also, um, yeah. Also, but what's unfortunate is that, yes, um, there's a little while until we can officially pull up, but the thing about international agreements is that no one has to actually do anything, which is unfortunate. There's no such thing as international law. It's... Um, 
basically like strong recommendations and if you don't do them then you kind of ruin your reputation but you're not um, obligated technically as a government to fulfill these obligations so kind of what we're doing now as a country is um, completely gutting anything that we were going to do for Paris so yeah it kind of stinks but hopefully it'll get better. <laughs> Oh, what's that? So my question <laughs> is, um, what is like the one time that you f personally failed? <laughs> so one time I was in Long Island for, <laughs> interesting story. So I was in Long Island and I didn't really know my audience that well, so I was there spitting fire at the administration, and this was a really conservative audience, so they were all, all looking at me like, huh? So I didn't understand my audience, and I was not lashing out, but I kind of said a few trigger words, a few choice words about the administration, and they were kind of into climate change, but they got all their funding for their organization from the federal government. So, yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> <coughs> Can you come back to me? Pass it to oh. <laughs> okay. Um, the, this isn't like a moment of failure so much as it's like something that was disappointing to me, kind of. Um, I got this fellowship this summer um, in environmental communications, which is something I'm super interested in. And so I was like, this is going to be great. And I didn't apply for anything else. I just, I got the fellowship and took it. I was like, this is a job. It pays me money. I'm going to learn things. It's great. And it was a class in, this, in the spring semester and um, an internship in the summer. And then I was supposed to present about it at the end of the summer. And um, unfortunately, um, I realized um, a little bit too late that I had taken something that I really didn't want and I was like great I'm stuck here and I have to spend my whole summer doing a job I didn't want and um, I think that one of one of the things I learned from this um, was one you can make a good experience out of a job that you don't like I guess um, like it wasn't you know the most fulfilling and um, intellectually stimulating thing I've ever done but I did get to do a lot of cool um, marketing and communications work for an environmental organization but um, the other thing is that don't uh, let yourself be guided by um, frankly like money and opportunities like that because um, I think that I could have found myself in a much more interesting situation had I not just taken the first thing that came my way um, like I guess just think highly of yourself and um, recognize that not every opportunity is exactly for you so that's yeah <laughs> I guess this is this is very small, but um, I wish that while I was in college that like I did some like internships or like um, jobs like outside in like I guess with like environmental organizations. Um, yeah, that's just all. It would it would have been better for me to like learn more skills and like different things and um, be more prepared. I guess if <laughs> yeah. On the note of college, I'm in my first semester, and. Again, like on the note of being a certified adult, I am not one yet. Like officially, maybe, like I'm called that, but I'm struggling <laughs> in terms of like trying to manage um, the activism work that I might do outside of my campus. And then like being on campus and studying calculus, which is like not my favorite thing, you know? And I'm doing pre-med and I'm taking a lot of like challenging science courses because I want to do environmental health or something in that intersectional field um but it's just that i have to learn how to prioritize and currently i'm failing at that <laughs> thanks so unfortunately we have to close with one last question um and 
to close our panel, if you could each share, if you just have one sentence of advice that you could give to a group of young people about to work on a climate action plan and really think about how they're going to take these skills out into the world, um, what would your one sentence of advice be? <laughs> Don't be afraid to call your elected officials. Don't be afraid to show up at their houses because I've done that. <laughs> don't, <laughs> and don't be afraid to voice your opinion. Don't be afraid of losing your friends because if they were your friends, they'd respect your opinion. And vote. I would say um, keep learning, teaching other people, um, just doing something like an, uh, joining an organization or a club, even if it's like a small action. Um, and like Professor Stage said yesterday, that you know you are a force of nature. So every little thing you do does matter. So. If you had a time machine and you could go back in time, you would want to do a small action to change the course of history, right? So. Why can't that same mentality apply to the present? You should take all the small actions, all the small climate actions, because ultimately that's going to affect the future of climate change and the way that our world functions. So keep doing that. Um, I guess just recognize that you're all leaders, which is really cool. You're all climate leaders, um, and you don't have to be a real adult, I don't think any of us are real adults, um, <laughs> um, to take action and to be powerful. And um, people will be impressed by you. They'll be, um, if nothing else, like intimidated, especially if you walk in like with 10 of your friends and say, we demand climate action on this thing to your village board or your school board. Um, there's power in numbers, and there's strength in youth. Well, thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy college schedules and your lives in general to come share your wisdom with us. I know I've heard you all speak a few times before, and I'm always left with a sense of fire and hope for what we're about to do in the future. And so thank you for sharing that with us. And um, let's give them one more round of applause. <laughs> and so the ACE Fellows will be around till 1 today when they have to leave, so you can talk to them. Um, and talk to them more before then, and then Caroline, are you have to leave right away. Okay, so <laughs> we'll say bye to Caroline. Um, bye, Caroline. <laughs> so thanks. We're going to transition again now um, to our bright spot <laughs> section. So as we kind of transition out of panel mode, if the students that are presenting in the bright spots portion of the morning could come line up over here um, behind the podium. Thanks. I did awesome.
Okay, so it looks like we've switched over again. Um, so for our bright spots portion of the morning. So when we were thinking about the 10th anniversary, we were thinking about all of the amazing work that's been done by schools and students across New York State that have been a part of building this amazing youth climate community that we have now. Um, so we wanted to give some time in the summit to showcase some of these bright spots, these projects from across the state, um, and give a selection of students some time to share with you all their projects. Um, and then, so you can think about this as you move into the climate action planning portion of the day, think about the projects that these students did, and they'll be around for the rest of the day, most of them. So you can talk to them. If you see something that your school would like to do, these students will all be available as resources um, to talk to them about their projects. Um, so each school is going to have three minutes to share with you a little snapshot of their project. So some of this will be video. Some of it will be talking. Um, it'll be a mix. So It'll be quick, it'll be snappy, and we'll get this really cool picture of what's going on um, with youth-led climate action across New York State. So to start it off, we have Lily Flanagan from Lake Placid. Uh, hi, I'm Lily, and I'm from Lake Placid, and I go to the Central School. And I wanted to um, share with you guys what we did for our climate action plan. And for our climate action plan, we created a green market at our school. And it was right outside, so anyone who like, lived around town could like, see what was happening and they can come. This project, we wanted to make this project because we wanted to support local farmers. And we also wanted to bring the community together as a whole. And we wanted to celebrate our town becoming a climate smart com community because it is now. <laughs> and we wanted to um, um, uh, make the mayor come to the, um, the <laughs> event. <laughs> and we plan to continue fundraising and we plan to continu um, continue supporting local farmers as well as bringing the community together as a whole. And we created this video to show you what we did for our green market. I was very inspired to do something big for my community, so I took over the project, The Green Market. Now, this was to bring the community together and educate them about climate change. And we also had the mayor come and announce that we are now a climate smart community. And this was very empowering to the students as we had worked very hard to get to this. And it was just a great way to tell everyone what we're doing. It's, it's a privilege to be here today uh, as, as a guest of the Lake Placid Environmental Club, who has been in conversations with the village over several months, looking at various uh, opportunities that will help our community be a more energy conscious, uh, climate conscious community, maybe. And, and why not Lake Placid? All right, next up, uh, Andrew and Shiniqua from Homer Central School. Or just Andrew, just kidding. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm from, I'm Andrew, I'm from Homer, which is just south of Syracuse. Um, we created a video for you um, that showcases two of our recent projects in the past few years. Um, so on one hand, we've been working on um, a solar project. So we now have a solar charging station in our school's library that can charge between 12 and 15 Chromebooks. Um, it's been very successful. When I went up to plug my Chromebook in the other day, uh, all the outlets were filled. So that was a really great feeling. Um, also, we've been working on a gardening and composting program. Um, so a few years ago, we started composting in our cafeteria and got our waste reduced from six bags of trash to only two per day. Um, and we have created a school garden and a school greenhouse. Um, so the video that you're about to see um, will showcase two different aspects. On one hand, we wanted to share um, our school pride so that the district could use it in all of their marketing. Um, and as well, we obviously highlighted those different projects for you to see.
right, next up is Kyla from St. Regis Falls Central School. I'm Kyla. I'm Haley. And I'm Alexis. And we go to St. Regis Falls Central School. Um, so our project was that we made a video that highlights our plastic reduction project through our education, the installation of two water bottle refilling stations. And we also sold refillable water bottles. Um, we chose this project because we have mostly have a focus on waste reduction in our school. This year, our school has decided to remove reusable utensils from the cafeteria. We thought the initiative would counteract the plastic that is being produced in the waste in the cafeteria. Through our project, we have sold 80 water bottles and averted the use of 13,000 plastic water bottles. Over the course of this project, we have learned many things, but the most important was that teamwork is key to making big projects successful, and that it takes more than just one person to accomplish your goals. All of our video work and creativity has led to this. I want to fill up my water bottle from the Adventure Club. What is it? I think it fills your water bottle. Well, it is a water bottle filling station, so I hope so. But where did we get it? It was donated by the Adventure Club. Where'd they get the money? A grant. Hmm. I wonder if by using these bottles, we're saving plastic. Did you know on top of all the plastic water bottles we use, the U.S consumes 500 million straws each day. Well, I'm so thankful for the Adventure Club for providing this information for us. Now we can stop so much plastic use in our school. Along with our amazing water bottle filling station, the SRS Adventure Club has decided to further its plastic reduction initiative by creating these cool cans that you see here. These are to ensure that students know where plastic water bottle waste goes. The SRS Adventure Club hopes to reduce all the waste created by plastic water bottles in their school. All right, Toby from Plattsburgh High School. Hi, my name is Toby and I'm the Vice President of Plattsburgh High School's Green Team. Our project this year was to create a composting system for our school's cafeteria to reduce our food waste. We were able to complete this, but once we did, we noticed that whole fruits were being composted. So to solve this, we created a donation system. So kids who don't want their fruit can put it in a basket to be taken up to the main office for kids who do. Uh, we plan to continue to spread food um, waste awareness, and I think it's been very effective, and our video will go more into detail. <laughs> Dr. Science, and today I'm here with PHS's green team talking about what they did with their mini grant. Hi, I'm Mrs. Schultz, and what we did with our mini grant this year is we built a compost bin. Look, three different layers. One, two, three. Every day, Jordan, say hi, Jordan. Hi. Jordan picks up the compost from the cafeteria and brings it out here and puts it in. Composting is a great way to reduce our school's Carbon footprint. <laughs> 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 the most interesting thing about our compost project is not the compost itself, but it makes us take a closer look at our garden. When we first started composting, on the very first day, we noticed that this entire bin was full of apples. The only problem is, is they were all uneaten apples. That's a real big waste. So we came up with a solution. Are you kidding me? Get out of here, man! Our solution to this problem was to ask students to donate their fruit instead of throwing it away. Thank you! <laughs> so once the fruit has been donated, then we just bring it up here to the main office and we transfer the fruit from the donated fruit basket to the free fruit basket. Would you do the honors, Grace? 
And now everybody has access to free fresh fruit. Woo! Free fruit! love to thank you for the mini grant. We think that was very successful and successful in ways that we hadn't anticipated, like being able to give free fruit to most of the school. So thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, Annette from Westport Central School. It's a tough act to follow, huh? <laughs> All right, let's bring our attention back to Annette. I know she has a tough act to follow, right? Like, yeah, it's pretty tough. Um, I'm Annette. I'm a junior at Westport, and last year was my first climate summit. Um, I came away inspired, and I applied for the AYCS mini grant for a water bottle filling station at our school to reduce plastic use and increase hydration. So I was fortunate enough to receive that grant. Um, that made a pretty impossible idea possible since our school has no funding. Um, uh, the filling station is used all the time and, the, um, and we're currently putting together a composting program to reduce food waste in the cafeteria. Here's a video that some other juniors made in a video production class about last year's project. <coughs> Tyreek and Rofayat from Kurt Hahn Expeditionary Learning School. Do you want me to do your slides? Uh, yeah. I'll you one. Here. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Tyreek Woods. Hi, everyone. My name is Rofayat Olaskomi. And we're from Kurt Hahn Expedition Learning School. So our project started when we were inspired by ACE, actually, and we felt as though that we needed people to feel informed of climate change and what they can do to help us out in any way to perform. So we first, we went to the Parent Teacher Association to help us out with uh, sign up and showing that you can do one thing. Our first project was at our SLC, our student-led conferences. We set up a table in a little booth to show that you can come over and sign a piece of leaf showing that you can do one thing and a small thing can lead to big changes. And I think it was this, yeah, this May, we held our first climate summit and the people that attended for our workshops were the people there. So I just like to give a round of applause to all the people that are right there right now. So even though I know Ace is right over there, so they just came to us. And our guest speaker was uh, Stanley Fritz. Stanley Fritz was a campaign manager of Citizens Action of New York City. He is an engineer slash co-host of a radio show called Let Your Voice Be Heard. One positive outcome of this project was that we're able to inform and let other people that didn't know about climate change more informed about it and also slow down the um, impacts of climate change. And also, we also noticed that we're able to like, we're able to see more people, more um, parents and um, students taking actions in plan consigning, um, slowing down the impacts of climate change. 
And also during this project, one thing we learned was that it was hard to um, make people know that every little thing counts and every little thing could make a great impact. So um, our climate, our climate club plan continues to um, create a garden which which will take place in spring. That's the garden. So we plan the climate club plans to um, create a garden which will take place in spring. And also for the past um, one week, um, about 17 students has been taking plan in our class to um, train them in creating prototypes for plants. And um, so next spring we plan we plan to um, start our own garden and grow plants. And our plan and our plan is to. Um, create fresh food for our school community and also um, encourage them to eat fresh food because it can be hard to find and also expensive. And um, would also like you guys to please, if you can add us on our Instagram page, which is hhkh underscore green club, if you could do that right now, so you could see more about our, um, our garden plan and also what we do in our climate club. And would also like to inform you all about uh, our, cli our next climate summit, which is next year by May 4th. And would all like it if you can all be there and you all be welcome. All right, we decided to let one adult talk during this time. Crystal Ford from Schools for Climate Action. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm up here because I'm a parent and I have a, a first grader. So um, this is on behalf of my first grader. So um, I went to my school board last, um, last year um, using the Schools for Climate Action uh, website and asked the school board to pass a climate change resolution stating that climate change is a children's issue, that it's real, and that all levels of government should act on climate change. And there's a bunch more that goes into the resolution. We can go to the next slide. Um, and you can come see me later, and I can talk more about the resolution. But what is great about climate change resolutions is that you can all go back to your school right now. You can look up when your school board holds its monthly meeting. You can go with your friends and speak during open comment and ask your school to pass a climate change resolution. Um, what's great about the climate change resolution is that um, our board members of the school are elected officials. And we know very well that elected officials are just silent when it comes to climate change. So what better place to start than school boards because their whole mandate is to look out for your well-being. Um, I'm going to to the next page. Yeah. So there are 14,000 schools, school boards in this country. And as of last December, the first school board resolution was passed in California. And since then, there have been, I think, 22 that have passed. And Garrison, where my son goes to school, is the first one on the East Coast. Ours got passed in July. And then a couple weeks ago, a school board resolution was passed in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, and so it's a way for, to finally break the silence around climate change and ask these elected officials to speak out and then make a commitment. What is, what is your school going to do? Um, my son's school is going to incorporate climate change into the curriculum. We're holding a youth climate summit next year, May 17th, Garrison. That's an hour north of New York City. And, um, and also, every time we make a decision, like maintenance or transportation or building, we're going to think about how can we reduce our carbon footprint. So I highly recommend you check out the Schools for Climate Action website. There's a ton of resources. And yeah, so thank you very much. <laughs> And last but not least, Callan from Parachutes for the Planet. You get to hear what this cool parachute out there is all about. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Callan Benson. I'm 14 years old. I'm from Annapolis, Maryland. Um, first, I want to thank Kelly and Gina and Jen for inviting me here. And thank all of you for being here. It's really incredible for me to be in a room full of young people excited about this issue. So some of you may have noticed the parachute that's outside. Some of you may have signed it. That is going to be part of a global project called Parachutes for the Planet. You can go to the next slide. So 
Parachutes for the Planet is a global initiative to have youth all over the world create parachutes, round banners to raise awareness and encourage action on climate change. Currently, we have almost 300 parachutes from every continent except Antarctica. And we just started the project last January. So it's really exploded very quickly, <laughs> um, which means I'm going, I get really busy and sometimes a little overwhelmed. <laughs> but it's really resonated with people. We have four parachutes from the Marshall Islands, no, none of them are up there, that the kids wrote letters with their parachutes and they sent them to us. The two questions in the letters were, what would you say to the US president? if you could talk to him. And then what do you think the Marshall Islands was gonna look like in 20 years? And listening to those kids talk about what they think their future is going to be like, and talking to the US president saying, I know you don't know what the Marshall Islands is, let me explain it to you, <laughs> was so powerful. We also have a little girl in Kenya, she's only eight years old, who's going around to schools and planting trees while making parachutes. And then there's, um, there's a group in Lithuania who got so excited they made their own video in Lithuanian and sent it out to schools around the area to get other kids to make parachutes. We also have other displays. So there's, there was, um, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I get tongue-tied sometimes. But what we do with these parachutes is we display them in massive displays to educate people and to encourage action. And we've had a display in San Francisco, as well as a display on the National Mall in Washington, DC. Uh, there was a display at the Citizens Climate Lobby Conference in June. And then there was one in Ottawa at another Citizens Climate Lobby Conference with about 12 parachutes. There's also going to be a parachute display in Cameroon, where they're collecting 40 parachutes to display. And then one in Panama, they're collecting parachutes to when the Pope comes, they're going to have a display. So it's really resonated with people around the world, which is really exciting for me. And we're going to be continuing to collect these and display them in the near future. So thank you all for listening and thank you all for coming. <laughs>I know that there's so many other people in this audience that could also be up here and we hope at future summits that you all will be up there sharing all of the amazing work you've done. So let's have one more round of applause for all of our bright spots. <laughs> Lots of those students are gonna be out during the poster session so you can catch up with them then if you have follow-up questions. Um, there's also gonna be lots more schools available during the poster session that you can talk to um, to get advice and ideas for your climate action plan. So, do you have a lot of ideas now? <laughs> like how many cool ideas was that? Now is the time where we're gonna transition from talking about all these ideas and learning about solutions to actually crafting a climate action plan that you're gonna take with you. This is the most important part of the summit. So I know we've been in the theater for a little while, but we're just gonna be here maybe 20 more minutes, learn how to do a climate action plan, and then you're gonna get to go start crafting your own. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Elise, who's gonna get us started um, with the climate action plan. So thank you, Erin. Um, before I start, I just wanna get a feel of the room. How many of you know what Project Drawdown is? Oh, wow, more than I expected. Okay. <laughs> um, so today you'll be making your, climate, your own projects, and some of you may be asking, where do I start? Um, luckily for us, there's already an existing roadmap of solutions called Project Drawdown. Drawdown is the point at which we pull more carbon out of the air than we emit. Our ultimate goal is to reach drawdown. Thanks to a team of scientists from all over the world who have studied and analyzed all of the many solutions to climate change, we now know that drawdown is possible using existing te technologies and practices. Whew, sorry. <laughs> um, and not only is it possible, it's also affordable. If our generation is going to reach drawdown, we have to start now. 
there is no one solution that will get us there. We have to change the way we get our food and energy, the way we build our homes and schools, and the way we move around the world and use our land. Um, today, as you're figuring out what to do with your climate action project, remember what sectors produce the most CO2. Think about what cat category you want to improve upon in your community or school. Is it food, energy, women and girls, or any of the other categories up here? I encourage, oh, yeah. <laughs> I encourage you today, tomorrow, or the next day to go to Project Drawdown website and look at the solutions that they have up. I guarantee you'll be surprised at what you find. Remember that reversing global warming is possible. I know all of this stuff is really depressing, but we're going to try to focus on the solutions now. And this site is amazing for that. It has 100 solutions, and all of them really do make a huge difference. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Anya to talk about your climate action plan. I just want to say one thing. Uh, thanks, Elise. I just wanted to clarify real quickly, you might be wondering what the women and girls section is. I heard some <laughs> a lot of whispering going on after that. Um, if you go to the Drawdown website and you'll see this list of the most top 100 most high impact solutions and high impact in terms of how much carbon or how uh, their greenhouse gas reduction potential, number six, which is actually blocked out by this, is women and girls. Um, when women are empowered in a community and have access to education and resources, um, that family planning is one of the biggest um, greenhouse gas reduction strategies that there is. So it's not one that we talk about very often, but it's one that shows up in Drawdown a lot. So just wanted to answer that for folks. <laughs> All right, take it away. All right, my name is Anya Morgan. I'm from Lake Placid High School. And who here is ready to save the world? Oh, come on, guys. I know you can do better than that. Come on. Who's ready to save the world? Yeah. Sorry, that was the wrong button. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so in your team folders, you have a document that is labeled Climate Action Plan. And when we leave this room, it is your turn to make a plan to help your school reach Drawdown. Do you just want me to do it? You just do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I want you to think about your school and community and everything you've learned about climate change. I want you to brainstorm ways that your community can help um, reduce carbon emissions and help the environment. So for developing your climate action plan, you're going to want to start with um, figuring out your like main idea. And you want to make sure that this is very specific. And working on one project at a time is key because you don't want to bring too much work onto yourself. And you want to create goals that are SMART goals, which is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. This will help you stay on target and help you get through your project smoothly. <laughs> so for Lake Placid's first goal, we, just, we knew that our biggest problem was food waste. We had so much. So we made it our main goal to divert all of the waste from landfills. So to do that, we had to reach out to North Country School about using their drum composter. After we got confirmation from North Country School, we had to actually set up the compost. So we went into our cafeteria, and it actually took about three months um, to kind of monitor everything and train everything. Um, there were a lot of mix-ups at first. Um, in case anyone doesn't know, plastic cannot be composted. <laughs> And then we had to actually collect all the compost, um, and we had to sort through it and make sure that there were no mix-ups that we missed or anything. Um, and then we had to weigh it and add all of our um, wood pellets and then mix it all together and then shovel it into the drum composter and press start. So, oh wait, is this? Okay. <laughs> So um, through the process, we had to keep everybody involved. Um, so for us, this was students, um, administration, uh, the school board, maintenance staff, cafeteria staff. Okay. 
So next you want to create a calendar for three specific goals. Your short-term goals should be realistic and time-bound, and your long-term goals should be, you should be able to break them down to make them more manageable throughout the year. So next you want to think about what you need for this project. This is very important to like plan out what you need or else you know, you're going to forget along the way and that's not good. <laughs> so how you track your success is also very key. Ours was easy because it's just how much compost we made. Yours might be the number of hours that you put into something or I don't know, the amount of money that you fundraise at a certain event. So this project mostly fell on all the students as they were the ones bringing the compost back and forth. So we really had to keep in contact with them as well as people like the cafeteria staff so they knew um, and we also had to get approval from the school board. So once your project is up and running and everything is going smoothly, it's time to start talking about your project. So one really great way to do this is putting posters around your school and you can also um, uh, use your school social media account to make posts on it there. But you, you don't have to just limit yourself to posters and social media. You can also make big, bold statements by, say, going to your school board, making a school-wide presentation, or even putting something in local news media outlets. And so here is a really great example of a communication tool. So how are we going to get more people to compost? Yes, Molly? Okay, so my plan is super simple. And it starts from educating everyone. If we can just show each and every one of our fellow classmates the utter importance of keeping food waste out of landfills, then we can stop climate change, prevent water pollution, conserve wildlife habitat, and make compost to grow more plants, thereby changing the world as we know it. Great idea, Molly. Anyone else have any ideas? I think I got an idea. All we need is a team of about four to five people controlling the cans every day. We just have to make sure that everyone is composted. Whenever we catch any of those spectators, we take matters into our own hands. And then there'll be a personal one. Great job. Thank you for your input, Jack. Anyone else? I think I got you. Just the solution. Okay. We can show people that helping us. In turn, helps them. Then there's no reason not to get everyone composted. Thank you, Vinny. We will definitely think about that. All right, does anybody have any simpler solutions? Solutions to what? We have to figure out a way to make everyone compost. What more of a reason do you need? I mean, it's really easy to do. It helps the environment. He doesn't get it, guys. Back to the drawing board. video was shown in all the homerooms in Lake Placid so they right yeah. yeah so they showed that to all the students to help educate them how to sort their trash so now that we've kind of gone through what the climate action plan consists of and what you should do it's time for you to go make yours once you have a plan reference it often and to keep track of all your notes that you take here because you're gonna forget your original ideas and they're not gonna be good as good as later on. So reference everything you have now. So I want you to go back and think about the Bright Spots presentation we just had. A lot of these projects were funded by mini grants. Now, if money stands in between you and your climate dreams, please check out the mini grants program. It will be sent to all of your teachers and is available on the website where the agenda is. It is I think December 14th is the date that that is due. Okay, are there any questions? No questions? You're like, we got it? Easy? <laughs> okay, so I want you to find your school, get in teams, and you have about 40 minutes to work on this presentation.